Hi, welcome to Distinti University Engineering Q Vectors. This is the course on definitions. From the previous two installments of this course, we've learned, got a general idea of what vectors are. Vectors are a direction and a magnitude. But we need to define things in such a manner to prevent confusions, and so we're going to do some definitions. Again, we discussed in the last video what a coordinate system is. A, co a coordinate system is a collection of orthogonal and we're going to define this word, so don't worry about if this word looks scary to you. Dimensions that represent real, measurable units. Okay, in this, this course, and in ethereal mechanics, vectors are going to only ever represent real, physical, measurable manifestations. I don't use math on an abstract basis unless um, it makes things simpler to do so. Okay, I try to keep everything in terms of things you can really measure and really uh, detect. Okay, for example, the Cartesian coordinates we showed before uh, had its orthogonal dimensions, again we're going to just find that, in x, y, z, and they had a length in meters, a real measurable quantity. Another kind of vector, this is where I'm expanding the definition of vectors, can be apples and oranges. Okay, you can have a uh, a modeling system or some system you have to, let's say it's a fruit vending machine and have you have a vector of fruit that you have, may have to vend. So you can pretty much, as long as there are orthogonal quantities that can't be added, and we'll explain what that means, you can have a vector that's of tangible objects like apples and oranges that can't be added. Okay, the other thing we have to talk about is what's called right-hand coordinate systems. What's a right-hand coordinate system? Well, we have three perpendicular dimensions that represent our Cartesian coordinate system. And in a right-hand coordinate system, if you roll, and the purpose of this is to define where z is in respect to x and y, or x and y. In a right-hand system, if you start your hand at x and rotate it toward y, z comes up into the vertical. Okay, and that's important because that's called the right-hand rule for a right-hand coordinate system, and that's how you keep track of where Z should be. And, and when you're talking to other people, you say, I'm using a right-hand coordinate system, or sometimes you'll say, I'll use a left-hand coordinate system. It depends on what you're modeling. A left-hand coordinate system is the opposite of the other one. You start your left hand at X, rotate toward Y, and you'll find that Z goes up also out of the page, but that's because I switched where Y was. Because if I did that, the right hand, put your thumb where Z is going to be. Go from X to Y and Z would be down. So in the right hand system, th this would be down. If you have X and Y arranged this way, your right hand Z would be going positive downward. Otherwise, you go from X to Y in a left hand system and your Z goes up. So it's just a case of, okay, so if you have X and Y, okay, left hand is up, okay, and no, sorry, right hand is up. Okay, and then your left hand would be down. So that, that's the difference between a left and a right hand system is which way Z goes with respect to X and Y. Okay, because if, you, if you're talking to another person, they're thinking in terms of a right hand system and you're trying to describe them something in a left hand system, then you guys aren't going to be talking apples and apples. You're going to be getting stuff backwards. So it's important that when you describe something to other people, you tell them what coordinate system you're using. You're using a Cartesian coordinate with a right-hand Cartesian coordinate system or something of that nature. Now, orthogonal, that's a word that throws many people. Okay, so people sometimes confuse orthogonal with perpendicular. Now, while it's true that perpendicular quantities are orthogonal, there may be parallel quantities that are also orthogonal. Now, what I mean by perpendicular, when you have something, a line here and, and a line line comes off at 90 degree angle, we say that those are perpendicular. And that's why these coordinate systems work, because X and Y and Z come out in the other direction, and that would be a right-hand system. Okay, they are all perpendicular, and therefore they're orthogonal. But you may have quantities, like here's a particle in motion, and this particle has a velocity. I show velocity as a single headed arrow, and it also is accelerating. And that's accelerating, I show, as a double-headed arrow. So even though the velocity and the acceleration are parallel, you can't add them because 
This is in the units of meters per second squared, where this is in the units of meters per second. Okay, so you can have quantities that are parallel, but they can't be added because their units are different. Okay, just like you can have a stack of apples parallel to a stack of oranges. You can't add them because oranges are not apples. Okay, because that's what orthogonal means. You can have quantities that's, that are vector quantities that are parallel to each other that you can't add because their quantities are not compatible. Okay, so orthogonal, yeah, things that are perpendicular are automatically orthogonal. But they, things can also be orthogonal if the, if, the, if the units of those quantities are not compatible. Okay, to clear that up, because we're going to be going into wave theory and we're going to show you why engineers use complex, not in this course, but when we get to wave theory, why engineers use e to the j omega when discussing waves. Here's Distinti's expanded definition. A vector is a summation of real measurable orthogonal quantities which correspond to the coordinate system in use. Okay, here's vector A which we defined as 10x plus 3y plus 7z. Okay, x, y, and z are the orthogonal dimensions of the coordinate system that we're using. And x, y, z are here defined in meters. So the magnitude of A, if we take 10 squared plus 3 squared plus 7 squared, take square root of that in meters, we're going to get that the magnitude of A is equal to 12.57 meters. But we could also have a vector de defined in terms of other orthogonal quantities like apples. B could be 10 apples plus 3 oranges plus 7 grapes. But because these are orthogonal but they're not quite in the arrangement that a right or a left hand system is, you might define the magnitude of such a system as being just the summation of the different elements which would give you 20 fruit. Okay, so your coordinate system and the system you're modeling may have different rules. And when we get into Q vectors, you're going to find out that there's virtually infinite rules out there. You've got to be careful which rule set we're going to use for any given modeling system. Okay, but it's going to be easier for us because when we get to ethereal mechanics, we're going to pick one and it's going to satisfy everything. So vector notation. How do we write stuff down so that we can talk to each other? Well, variables that represent vectors are typically boldface, which boldface. And when we have a vector and we want to represent it with quantity, numeric values, we'll say 10x plus 3y plus 7z, where these values represent the coordinates of the coordinate system, the, the, the orthogonal components of the coordinate system being used. Now, when we don't have actual numbers yet, when we're just trying to work with vectors from the standpoint of hypothetical, we don't know what the values are just for an expression. We could say that, well, a is equal to ax plus ay plus az, where this means the component of a in the x direction, the component of a in the y direction, and the component of a in the z direction. Okay, this represents one variable, not two, even though there's two characters. And just so you don't get blindsided, you know, variable b would have the same thing, the component of b in the x direction, the component of b in the y direction, the component of b in the z direction. And so that any number, any va variable, any letter you use to represent a vector would be represented this way. And the reason why we do this is because later on we're going to do something like a multiplied by b, and we're going to have ax's and by's all mixed together when we do the derivations for q vectors. So this notation is going to be very important. And again, these variables are not limited to single letters for the sake of this course. Single letters used to keep the algebraic expressions as short as possible. So later we're going to define not in this part of the course, when we get back to ethereal mechanics, we're going to find electric charge in terms of vectors, where Q is the quantity of a charge. And that's a scalar. We're going to define scalars in a bit. Uh, P is the position of the charge. V is the velocity of the charge. And A is the acceleration of the charge. Again, velocity is represented with a single head arrow. Acceleration is represented with a double open head arrow. Where position, uh, I use a single head arrow, but I think I use a closed head arrow like that. Okay, so that's how we're going to represent charges when we get back to ethereal mechanics. That's just, we're not going to use that now. Again, this is a recap of magnitude and direction. A vector is comprised of a magnitude and direction. Sometimes we need to know just the magnitude or direction, and we represent the magnitude of A with A with the absolute value brackets around it. That would be the, just the length of the vector A. And when we want to know the direction, we represent that as A with the caret on the top, that means we just want the direction of the vector A. And again, 
To get back to A, you multiply the direction times the magnitude to get back to A. Now, vector addition is quite simple in Cartesian coordinates. Vector addition is represented the vector C is equal to vector A plus vector B. If A is 20x plus 15y and B is minus 5x plus 10y, then C is just the summation of the two where you sum the x components for x and you sum the y components for y, which would give you the result of 15x plus 25y. Okay, you could do it graphically like this and you would get the same answer. Vector subtraction works the same way in reverse. Let's say we started with C and we want to find A. So you take vectors. I only did that so I didn't have to come up with three brand new vectors. Okay, C minus B is equal to A. So if C is 15x plus 25y and B is minus 5x plus 10y, well then you subtract from 15, you subtract the 5, which is the same as adding 5. That would give us the 20. And then the 25 minus the 10, 25 minus the positive 10, which gives us 15. And we can see that A is the same thing we defined earlier when we when we summed it to, be, to get to C. So that kind of shows you that subtraction, addition and subtraction are reciprocal val, uh, functions in vectors. Scalar. This is the proper definition of scalar. I like the mathematician's definition of scalar. A scalar is a value that scales a vector. For example, it's like a multiplier. For example, given the vector 1x plus 3y is 7z plus 7z, you have a scale factor of 10. Well, then k times a is 10 times that, which is 10x plus 30y plus 70z. Okay, later I'm going to show when we get into q vectors that scalars exist only as matrices, which is called a scalar matrix. It has the same effect as this above, but representing it as a matrix opens up possibilities for you, and it is the proper definition. Uh, well, we'll get to that when we get to Q vectors later on. Scalar is also used in the world of physics to represent a non-mathematical uh, manifestation. I'm sorry, a non-mathematician used the term scalar to describe physical manifestations in a, which are non-vector in nature. These are typically energy distributions. For example, heat density in a bar. If we grab this is a, a bar of aluminum, and we apply the heat source to the center. Well, the energy, the heat distribution of the bar would look something like this, where this represents more heat and less heat. And then once you, once you start the simulation, or you, you let this thing go, you're going to see that the heat is going to start flowing until it becomes a uniform distribution. Okay, but the minute that energy is in motion, it's described in terms of vectors. Okay, so you can describe the energy distribution as a scalar field, but once that field, once that energy is in motion, it becomes a vector. Um, there's also the use of the word scalar out there by various. Uh, it's a serious undercurrent of people promoting scalar waves that many claim is the lost work of Tesla. As stated previously, if waves of energy are in motion, then vectors are the better representation of the phenomenon. And Tesla is one of those pioneers that forced people to start thinking in terms of vectors and phasers. Phasers are just a special kind of vector, which uses complex number. And a phasor and a quaternion are of the same family. And for him to use scalars to model wave phenomenon would be like Columbus believing the world is flat. It doesn't make sense. So these people that are saying that Tesla invented scalar waves it is a load of nonsense. Uh, there might be a scalar energy distribution, but once that energy distribution goes into motion, it's a vector baby, trust me. So recap. We define that coordinate systems represent real measurable dimensions. And vectors are real measurable quantities within the coordinate system in use. We talked about vector addition, vector subtraction, uh, the magnitude of a vector, and the direction of a vector, or the unit vector. We also discussed scalars. Uh, this ends the section on the definitions of vectors. As we start getting more into the course, we're going to start showing you more and more of what Q vectors are all about. And Q vectors will add another dimension to three space to allow multiplication and division to work properly. And we're going to get into all that, so don't worry about it if you don't understand that now. Thank you very much.